I choose a five verse hymn because I had to run upstairs and do all that. Let's take our Bibles and turn tonight to the book of Acts. We're looking at the last few verses of Acts chapter 11. Tonight it is Acts 11 verses 27 through 30. Famine and fellowship. Uh, it uh, oftentimes seems to us either there's feast or famine, but tonight the passage deals with famine and fellowship. And we'll see there's a very key connection between those two when it comes to believers in the body of Christ. Before we do that, let's look to the Lord in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you once again for the privilege of studying your word. And we pray that you will bless and direct in our study tonight, that our Lord Jesus Christ would be exalted and glorified, that we would learn the practical implications of what it means to be called Christians as we studied last week. We pray, Father, that you will help us to understand practical theology and not merely theoretical theology. Help us to be accurate not only in our doctrine, but also in our lifestyles. We pray, Father, for your blessings upon your word as it goes forth tonight, that it will not return void, but that it will accomplish that which you please, and that it will prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. So we pray for your blessings on your word tonight to reach our hearts, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. May you recall last week we picked up where we had left off with the beginnings of the persecution by Saul after the death of Stephen. We'd had that little hiatus in there in the middle uh, where we had a number of historical events taking place. But now we pick up the story as to what happened to those Christians who were scattered abroad from the city of Jerusalem when Saul began his persecutions. And we saw that they went as far as a place called Antioch. And there we find Gentiles also believing in Antioch. We find also that Barnabas goes as far as Antioch. He sees what's taking place there at Antioch. And so he goes looking for Saul. He thinks these are people who need to hear a good Bible teacher. And so he finds Saul, as you see down there in verse 25. And then he brings Saul to Antioch. And we saw that because of what Saul, who is the Apostle Paul, teaches at Antioch, it transforms the lives of those people in such a way that they are first called Christians at Antioch. Now you think of all that's gone before, and we mentioned this last week, all that's gone before, the thousands of people who have been saved, the people at Jerusalem whom you would have thought would first be called Christians because of the tremendous revival that occurred there the day of Pentecost. You think in Acts chapter 2, you think of the uh, tremendous stands that Peter and John took in Acts chapter 4 and 5 where they're arrested by the Sanhedrin. You think of the other thousands, additional 5,000 being saved in addition to those first 3,000. You think of a booming, growing church. You think of the focus of the Pharisees on those believers there in Jerusalem that certainly they would have come up with the name they're a bunch of Christians they follow that Jesus Christ but it was not until we get to Antioch that they are first called Christians we saw that the obedience of the church to scatter abroad was actually fueled by persecution and we asked ourselves the question what will it take for us to learn today to be the witnesses that we're supposed to be we noted last week that God was patient with their delay so that by the time the persecution arose there were between 8,000 and 12,000 believers in Jerusalem so that it had become actually unwieldy. Then we saw that spread of the gospel through Acts 2, Acts 8, Acts 10 or 11 and learned different things about persecution that are actually beneficial. It caused an increase in the spread of the gospel rather than extinguishing it. And this past week I saw a very interesting a film which I perhaps will show, the Lord willing, uh, at our New Year's Eve service about the suffering church in China, the persecuted believers in China, based on real-life incidents of what is happening to Christians there at this time. Uh, and it reminds me very much of what was going on in the early church, where the more the persecution was that arose, the more the Christians grew. 
the church grew instead of being extinguished. We saw that it produced a separation of the real Christians from the phony Christians. We saw that it produced a zeal and a quickening of the spiritual life of those who were real Christians. We saw that it produced an open testimony and a bold witness in those who were real Christians. And we finally saw it resulted in obedience to the commands that God had given to us to start witnessing to more people. That's what persecution did in the early church. And I think that God wants us still to be involved in outreach, in the spread of the gospel, which was the point of that passage that we saw. We saw that a second set of corollary principles, obedience results in blessing. They started to see spiritual fruit. We saw that obedience that results in blessing always leads to interaction and fellowship between churches. And we're going to see that in detail tonight. We're going to expound on that particular principle of how this fellowship was developed during a time of suffering. Let me say that again. How fellowship was developed during a time of suffering. The first suffering the church went through where fellowship was developed was persecution. The second suffering that the church went through was famine. And it resulted in fellowship. God uses the difficult things in our lives to produce the sweet fruit that he so desires to see in us when we show love one to another in practical ways, not merely in theory. The third principle that we learned was obedience that results in blessing always leads to numerical growth, growth which is produced God's way, not through carnal manipulation and entertainment. There are a lot of churches today that use carnal manipulation. A lot of churches today that use the methods of the world, the music of the world, the acts of the world. They entertain their people, but they don't feed them. Those churches grow. Those folks come to church in halter tops and flip flops and do raucous things, play on their computers during church services and other things, but little do they worship. And then that brought us to the chief point of that lesson. They were called Christians. We saw that the word call was prematizo, which means to be given a name based on your chief occupation. That's a name that is used in ancient law to speak of a firm that's been constituted for business. It's only used twice in the New Testament. We saw the second time it was used of the woman who divorces and remarries, she shall be called an adulteress. She is given a name based upon her chief occupation. It ties in with what we spoke about this morning, so we won't belabor it here. That's Romans chapter 7. What a contrast. Called Christians, called an adulteress, showing the exact opposite extremes of the occupations. And then we ask the question, is your chief occupation being a Christian? Not whatever your secular job is, not how you support yourself, but is your chief occupation being a Christian? So that you are given a name based on that. Can we be called Christians? Those were excited Christians in Acts 2, excited Christians in Acts 3, excited Christians in Acts 4 and 5 and 6 and 7. But it was first at Antioch that they were given a name based on their chief occupation of being Christians. And so tonight we move into verses 25 through 30. Then departed Barnabas, I'll start reading in verse 25. Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. And in those days came prophets from Jerusalem to Antioch. And there stood up one of them named Agabus, and signified by the Spirit that there should be a great dearth throughout all the world, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea. 
which also they did, and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. The first major role reversal that we saw last week in this chapter is that the chief oppressor, Saul, became the chief teacher of practical Christianity. Radical, life-altering Christianity. So much so that the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. That was our main point last week. There was a role reversal in the life of Saul. Whatever your past life was, God's going to make some role reversals in it if you walk by faith and do things that are pleasing in His sight you'll suddenly discover some role reversals, and we're going to talk about three of those tonight, that happen here in this passage. What God does when he transforms a life which has come under his grace through faith in Christ. We think of Paul as the chief teacher of doctrine in the New Testament, and rightly so, that's true. But when we see Paul in action, in the book of Acts. What is recorded for us is not a series of doctrinal statements. What is recorded for us is the impact that he had on the lives of true believers. That brings us back to the theme that we've been hammering on on Sunday morning services. What you really believe affects how you live. If you really believe a lie, it will affect your life for evil. If you really believe the truth, it will produce a life that brings glory to God. Never look at the doctrinal epistles of Paul in any other way. That's very important. Never look at the doctrinal epistles as some kind of sterile boxed truth. The radical teaching of Paul is not merely so that you can categorize systematic theology, you know, bibliology, anthropology, theology proper, angelology, pneumatology, Christology, demonology, hamartiology, which is the doctrine of sin, soteriology, the doctrine of salvation, eschatology, the doctrine of last things, or ecclesiology, the doctrine of the church, and all those other ologies that are there. Paul did not write the New Testament merely so that you could have a tidy little box labeled systematic theology. The radical teaching of Paul is not so that you can do systematic theology. He wrote the epistles not merely so that you can have a watertight apologetic when you're arguing about the Trinity or Israel in the church or dispensations or covenants regardless of what your position on that is or the millennial kingdom. He didn't give you the epistles so you could argue. Paul makes it absolutely clear in his epistles which constitute the majority of the New Testament after the historical Gospels and Acts. That his doctrine is designed to radically alter your life by the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, that's what we see happening in the life of Paul as we read the narrative of Acts. Not merely that he's giving them long sermons in which we find lots of doctrine. We see the outworking of his teaching. It says he taught the disciples for a full year. And based on what he taught them for a year, when the need came, they responded instantaneously. What he taught had practical application. Did you know that those are the same things he teaches in the doctrinal epistles? We'll see that in just a little bit. For example, Paul's doctrine of sovereignty of God does give us comfort and strength when we face impossible situations. But the doctrine of the sovereignty of God was never designed to lull you into sloth and inactivity in witnessing. Just because God is in control doesn't mean that therefore you can coast. Paul's doctrine of election gives you courage in knowing that some will respond to the preaching of the gospel. He has his elect out there. That is encouraging. Because sometimes it seems, at least to me, that I'm battering against a solid brick wall. So we eagerly share Christ indiscriminately, not knowing who the elect 
But the doctrine of election was never designed to give you an excuse that if someone is elect, they will be saved, whether or not you obey the command to go into all the world. The second major role reversal that we see and that I want you to notice is in verse 29. Listen to what it says again. Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea. Now you remember, Jerusalem and Judea, that's the mother church. That's the initial group of believers. Jerusalem had been providing for the daughter churches in all of their necessary spiritual things. It was from Jerusalem that this great word had gone out and reached people all over the Roman Empire. The apostles remained at Jerusalem when the scattering of the believers occurred under the persecution raised by Saul. But now, the mother church of them all was going to suffer a deprivation. Now you know that it was not because the apostles were not good preachers. You know it was because there were not big enough offerings from the congregation at Jerusalem. No. God was going to send a famine specifically, and we'll see this in a moment. God was going to send a famine, and he's the one who sends famines. He causes it to rain. He withholds the rain. He causes crops to grow. He causes crops to wither. We see many illustrations of this throughout Scripture. God was going to send a famine specifically to test the love of the believers in other parts of the world. Did you know that Paul explains that very specific, exact principle in the doctrinal epistles? Romans chapter 15, verse 27. It hath pleased them verily, and their debtors they are, for if the Gentiles have been made partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister unto them in carnal things. Say, well, give me the context. All right, here's the context. We'll start in verse 24. Whensoever Paul is writing to the Romans, it's a bunch of Gentile believers at the city of Rome, that group of Italians, you know, that have been brought in in Acts chapter 10, Cornelius and his household, now it's going to more of those Gentiles, those Romans. Whosoever I take my journey into Spain, I will come to you, for I trust to see you in my journey be brought on my way thitherward by you, if first I be somewhat filled with your company. But now I go unto Jerusalem to minister unto the saints. Now, this is a passage about giving, so notice the connection. Giving is an act of ministry. I go to, unto Jerusalem to minister unto the saints, for it hath pleased them of Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor saints which are at Jerusalem. We're not guessing at this. He's talking about money. It hath pleased them verily. Now listen to the next few words. And their debtors they are. That is, these Gentiles of Macedonia and Achaia are debtors to the poor saints at Jerusalem. For if the Gentiles have been made partakers of their spiritual things, now listen to the next two words, their duty is also to minister, remember giving is an act of ministering, to minister unto them in carnal things. When therefore I have performed this, that is I'm carrying this to Jerusalem, when therefore I have performed this and have sealed to them this fruit, I will come by you into Spain. Paul's proposed journey through Rome all the way over to Spain. Now, notice the giving that's spoken of in this passage is not merely an option. It's a duty. In fact, Paul goes so far as to state that the reception of spiritual things puts the recipient in debt to provide material things to the giver of the spiritual things. That applies not only where one church gives to another, as we see here in Acts, but it also applies in paying the men gifted with the spiritual gifts of evangelists pastor, teacher, and teacher. You see, Paul is practical, not theoretical in his doctrine. When you get to the doctrinal epistles, remember, they reflect the practice of Paul and the other believers 
in the book of Acts. Listen to what he says in 1 Corinthians 9.11. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? When Paul wrote these epistles to Romans and to 1 Corinthians, he was not talking theory. He was talking about what he had already done in practice when he was sent from the church in Antioch to carry relief to Judea and Jerusalem. It's not, do what I tell you, but don't do what I do. It was, I've set the example for you. Now, it's your turn. The financial obligation of the church is based on the practical doctrine of stewardship. We are owners of nothing. We are stewards of everything. God is the owner. We are responsible for demonstrating practical love by the way in which we give, reflecting God's nature and God's love in giving. We mention that every Sunday morning, as you know, during the offering time, about how you can't buy your salvation, but if you're a believer, you give out of love because you've received everything you have and everything that you are based on his gift, the greatest gift of all, our Lord Jesus Christ. That kind of open-handing giving reflects what God taught Israel in the wilderness in that 40 years of wandering, that God meets our needs, not our greeds. You remember in the wilderness, God told them to collect it on a daily basis, and that was what they had for that day. And the following day, to collect again. And the following day, to collect again, and not to store it overnight. But on Friday, they were to collect twice as much, because they would have to take care of Saturday, too. And people tried many different systems that did not work. They tried to store it overnight, and what happened? It rotted. It got worms overnight, except on Friday night. That was not a natural occurrence. That was a supernatural occurrence. God was teaching them a principle which the Apostle Paul refers back to and which he practices here in Acts. In fact, just like manna hoarded, resources also rot and spoil when we hoard our resources. Paul refers to the experience in the wilderness in one of the most important New Testament passages on giving between churches. Listen to 2 Corinthians. The first passage we read was 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Now I'm reading out of 2 Corinthians chapter 8. As it is written, he's referring back to the Old Testament manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he that had gathered much had nothing over. And he that had gathered little had no lack. The giving, such as we see here in Acts chapter 11, is the proof of love. Let me read you the entire context of that verse I just read here in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, because he specifically says it is the proof of love. Beginning in verse 1. Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, they got special grace. Why? How that in a great trial of affliction. Now, now, wait a minute. I thought you said that they had a special grace. Yes, they did. It came to them during a time of affliction. But they had an abundance of something. It wasn't an abundance of money. But they did have an abundance of something. The abundance of their joy. Is that how you give? We'll read the rest of the passage in a moment and see that this is talking about giving. God loves a cheerful giver. The word translated cheerful is the word from which we get our English word hilarious. They had abundance joy, but what they didn't have was money. It says, and their deep poverty those were poor people that gave. Oftentimes, the poor give more than the rich. 
different studies have been done on the giving practices of politicians. And it is very frequently pointed out by people of different parties how the lead politicians of the opposing party are very stingy in the way in which they give. Here's a church that was full of poor people. Their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. That we would translate generosity. Liberal giving is generous giving. In fact, it's not just generous giving, but when you have deep poverty, it's sacrificial giving. Remember what we've been talking about in the morning worship services, presenting your body as a living sacrifice, which means that you are and everything that you have belong to Christ. And the question is, when was the last time you sacrificed anything for Christ? Paul goes on in verse 3, For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power they were willing of themselves they wanted to give. They were enthusiastic about giving. In fact, they were giving things that they needed. Not merely their surplus. They were giving things that they needed. Praying us, verse 4, with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. Giving is ministering. All three passages that we've looked at have told us that. Giving is ministering. It's humble service to other believers. He also mentions it as a fellowship. Take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. Do you like to have Christian fellowship? Did you know that the definition of fellowship is not red punch and cookies. Here's a fellowship. It's something that draws believers together in love. Sometimes we're on the giving end, sometimes we're on the receiving end. But what is true love and sacrificial giving, it develops a bond fellowship with the one who has genuine needs. I'm not talking about the panhandlers such as some we've had here in the church in the past. I'm talking about genuine needs. It develops a bond of love and a bond of fellowship because what we're doing is using the master's resources in the way that he says it's supposed to be done. And he is the one that brings the fellowship. Paul is talking from experience, not from theory here. Remember that, that giving is a means of fellowship, just like the text in Acts. Verse 5, 2 Corinthians 8, we're still there. And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. Did you know that's the will of God? This morning we were talking in Romans chapter 12 that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Prove means to manifest it openly. Something that's visible, something that can be seen, something that's tangible. That you can prove it. What is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God? And here he says, they first gave their own selves unto the Lord. There's the commitment we talked about in Romans 12. They had presented their bodies a living sacrifice, which meant that everything they had belonged to God. And unto us, that was a practical application, person to person, the day by day, exercise of the ministry of the hands and the feet, and the eyes and the ears and the speech, and the possessions of Romans 6. By the will of God, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Paul's doctrine is not theoretical. Paul's doctrine is practical. 
insomuch, verse 6, that we desired Titus, that as he had begun, so he would also finish in you the same grace also. Giving is called a grace. Caris. It's an exercise of grace. Therefore, as ye abound in everything, in faith, and utterance, and knowledge, and in all diligence, those are all good things, aren't they? Faith, yes. Utterance, yes. Knowledge, yes. Diligence, yes. Hasn't really gotten practical yet. And in your love to us, see that you abound in this grace also. Remember what he's talking about? He's talking about giving. He says, it's not that I'm trying to force you. Old Testament giving was forced. It was legally required. New Testament giving is not based on law. New Testament giving is based on love. That's what he says. Verse 8. I speak not by commandment. In other words, I'm not just putting you back under the law of the tithe. You better show up with that or else we're going to smack you. I speak not by commandment, but by occasion of the forwardness of others. There are others who set the example for you. You understand it. You've seen it. And to pr prove, now look at this, verse 8. And to prove the sincerity of your love. You say you love? Do you know how you prove your love? You prove your love by giving. That's what was going on from the church of Antioch to the church at Jerusalem. From the believers, even the poor ones at Antioch, to the church at Jerusalem. From the believers in Macedonia and Achaia to the church in Jerusalem. Jerusalem was the hardest hit during this famine. And so we see Gentile believers all over the ancient world taking up collections for the poor saints at Jerusalem. For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, here's your chief example, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that through his poverty ye might be rich. That's an example, isn't it? Tough one to follow. But that's the example we're given in Scripture. What did Jesus give up when he came from the courts of heaven and the glory of the Shekinah and the constant intense presence and fellowship of the Father and the Holy Spirit and came to earth to be born in a smelly stable and walk among dirty, stinking people who stubbornly rejected him and refused him and ultimately killed him what did he give up? Folks, he's our example of giving. That ye through his poverty might be rich. And herein I give my advice, for this is expedient for you who have begun before not only to do, but also to be forward a year ago. A year ago you made a promise. A year ago you were excited about giving. Now let's see the fruit of it. Now therefore perform the doing of it, that as there was a readiness to will, so there may be a performance also out of that which ye have. All talk, no action. Hey boys, let's get with it. Paul is exhorting them based on their former excitement and promise of giving. For if there be first a willing mind, it is accepted according to that a man hath, and not according to that he hath not. You want to give. That's wonderful. Did you know there's a basic principle, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, because it's what we see happening in Acts chapter 11. It is specifically mentioned. You give on the basis of what you have, not on the basis of what you don't have. We see that every man in Jerusalem, it says, or, or in uh, uh, Antioch, gave according to his ability. Paul is exhorting the Corinthians here to do the same thing. 
For if there be first a willing mind, it is accepted according to that a man hath, and not according to that he hath not. For I mean not that other men be eased and he burdened. Now here we get back to that same illustration of the Old Testament and the manna. But by an equality that now, at this time, your abundance may be a supply for their want. That their abundance also may be a supply for your want, that there may be an equality. You see, within the body of Christ, there is both inhaling and exhaling. If all you ever do is inhale, you will pop. There has to be an exhaling. At some occasions, you are the one providing for others. On some occasions, others will be the ones providing for you when the body of Christ is functioning the way that it's supposed to function. That's what Paul is talking about here. As it is written, here we are, man in the wilderness, he that gathered much had nothing over, and he that gathered little had no lack. Paul's doctrine goes all the way back into the Old Testament for practical illustrations that God gave of principles that run straight through the Bible. And one of those is everything belongs to God. We are not owners, we are stewards. Our job is to take what God puts into our hands and use it in the manner that God says it is to be used. And part of that is developing a love and a fellowship within the body of Christ by the way we use the resources that God has given to us to meet the genuine needs of other believers. Not their greeds, but their needs. He goes on in verse 16, But thanks be to God, which put the same earnest care into the heart of Titus for you. For indeed he accepted the exhortation. Now here's a young man who got up and did. He didn't just talk. But being more forward of his own accord, he went unto you. And we have sent with him the brother whose praise is in the gospel throughout all the churches. Titus and another were carrying this letter to the Corinthians. And not that only, but who was also chosen of the churches to travel with us with this grace. Now what's the grace we're talking about? We're talking about giving. Money that's being transferred from one church to another. Which is administered by us to the glory of the same Lord and the declaration of your ready mind. It's not only a ministry to other believers, it produces glory to God. Administered by us to the glory of the same Lord. Verse 20, avoiding this, that no man should blame us in this abundance which is administered by us, providing for honest things not only in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of man. Those are two very key verses that some churches have forgotten about. Those who handle church monies must be trustworthy. I'll give you a couple of illustrations from my own practical experience on this. In one church where I served as a pulpit supply, the treasurer was caught embezzling money, thousands of dollars, for a new boat, money to pay his bills, money for his own pleasure. He got caught. And God tends to do that when his money is being abused. Another Christian organization for which I did legal work years ago, in that organization the president was caught by the IRS for siphoning off organizational money for his own personal use and to pay off a mortgage on his home. Dangerous stuff, folks. You see, Judas was the treasurer also of the disciples and nobody ever expected him. to and through the church. Remember verse 20 and 21. Avoiding this, that no man should blame us in this abundance which is administered by us, providing for honest things not only in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of men. Sacrificial giving is blessed by God. God is jealous over those monies. And God will expose those who abuse it. Verses 22 and following. 
And we have sent with them our brother, whom we have oftentimes proved diligent in many things. Here's somebody who had already been proved. You know, that's one of the qualifications for men who are deacons. Already proved. He'd been proved diligent in many things, but now much more diligent upon the great confidence which I have in you. Whether any do inquire of Titus, he is my partner and fellow helper concerning you. Or our brethren be inquired of, they are the messengers of the churches and the glory of Christ. Here was a group of men sent by the churches to carry this offering and make sure it got all the way to Jerusalem. They were faithful men. They were trustworthy men. They were men who were not covetous. They were men who used wisely the resources that God put into their hands. They were men who made sure it all got where it was supposed to go. Verse 24. Wherefore, show ye to them and before the churches the proof of your love and of our boasting on your behalf. He says, a year ago you promised that you were going to take up a big offering. Now prove it. Show the proof of your love by the way in which you give. I've told other people about your love and how excited you were that you were going to give something. Is it hot air? What's the proof of your love? The third major role reversal that we see here in this passage in Acts is in verse 30. We'll start reading in verse 29. Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea, which also they did, and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. The role reversal that we see here, third role reversal that we've mentioned, is Saul, who used to confiscate the goods and property of the church, is now entrusted with a huge sum of money. Enough to meet the needs of all the believers in the church in Jerusalem. You see, Paul's teaching was not only doctrinal head knowledge. Paul's teaching changed the lives of the people at Antioch who heard it in one of the most stubborn areas of our lives. Our money. Do you remember how the churches gave there in 2 Corinthians 8? Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, how that in the great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and deep poverty abounded under the riches of their liberality. That's how they gave. And so we see, and there are many other passages, but I've chosen three of the main doctrinal epistles of the New Testament. The book of Romans the book of 1 Corinthians, the book of 2 Corinthians, we see that the doctrine that Paul taught in the church at Antioch is stated in the doctrinal epistles, but it's demonstrated in real life in the book of Acts. There are several other things that we need to notice here in this passage. Number one, the need was genuine. There was going to be a famine. Number two, God's people had advanced warning. Now, folks, we have advanced warning of all kinds of things in Scripture that we tend to ignore. People who don't take prophecy seriously are in serious trouble. One-third of the Scripture is prophetic. God was not batting his gums or trying to fill up pages so that he could make publishers rich by making a longer book. One-third of Scripture is prophetic. And a major portion of that prophecy is still future for us. It tells us what is going to happen in this world. It tells us why we're supposed to be doing what we're doing because of things to come. Did you know that if we move into an international economic system, that is digitally based without any real cash flow, your account could be eliminated overnight. It's already halfway there. Do you live in light of Scripture? Or do you live in light of what you think is enlightened self-preservation? Are you using the resources that God has given you in light of Scripture? 
Or are you hoarding the resources that God has given you for self? Look at the church in Acts. God's people did have advance warning. The third thing we learn from this passage is God has promised to always supply our needs. And you know that Paul states that in the doctrinal epistles. We see God supplying the needs of the believers at Jerusalem through the other believers. My God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Do you believe it? If you believe it, how has it affected your life? That's where the rubber meets the road, folks. What you really believe affects what you do. That's been the theme in Sunday morning when we've been talking about Jesus Christ, our righteousness. If you believe that, it changes how you live, the holiness of your life. As you believe the stewardship principles of Scripture, it changes how you deal with material things. Number four, God supplies our needs through His people in most circumstances. But if God's people refuse, He supplies our needs by other means. But His principal means is through His people. Number five, the genuine prophecies that God makes always happen. That's part of the test of a true prophet. There stood up one of them named Agabus and signified by the Spirit that there should be a great dearth throughout all the world. Postscript. Which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. He didn't just prophesy it. It happened. Even the Old Testament, 100% accuracy was the test of a true prophet. You make one mistake and you're dead. Deuteronomy 18. I will raise up to them a prophet from among their brethren like unto thee. I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command thee. That's a prophecy concerning Christ. And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. Did you know that Jesus said some things about giving? I will require it of him. Verse 20. But the prophet which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. And if thou say in thine heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord hath not spoken? Here it is. Test is 100%. You don't pass it with 100%, you fail the test. When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken, but the prophet hath spoken it presumptuously, thou shalt not be afraid of him. Pretty severe test. That's why we have the postscript about Agabus' prophecy. The sixth thing that we learn. Times of need not only come on countries, but can affect the entire world. It says there was a, a, a dearth that was going to come on the whole world. But you know, there are Christians that live in the world. That includes Christians in those areas and parts of the world that are affected. Number seven. When believers who have resources refuse to give to other believers... Not just giving to general nonprofit governmental organizations, those NGOs, as they're called. Not just, well, you know, I I gave to the Scouts, or I gave to the Heart Association, or I gave to Red Crosses. We don't see that in the New Testament. What we see giving is believers providing for other believers. When we don't give, other parts of the body of Christ suffer. Number nine, the church had been prepared for practical action by the teaching of Paul. He preached there, we mentioned it before, for an entire year. It came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. And in verse 27, notice what it says. In these days came prophets from Jerusalem unto Antioch. It doesn't say just prophets. It's prophet. It says prophets. Now, one prophet is named. His name was Agabus. And it's interesting that we're not told the names of the other prophets. And we're not told what their prophecies were. Instead, we're given the prophecy that produced an immediate response and outpouring of Christian love. 
a number of years ago, we held prophecy conferences in some of the churches where I served either as an assistant pastor or as a senior pastor. And you know, we had what we called prophecy freaks. Whenever we would hold a prophecy conference, there would people come out of the woodwork who never went to anything else. The only thing they ever attended was they would look in the newspapers for where was the next prophecy conference going to be. And they would always show up for that. And they had all kinds of head knowledge about prophetic future. We're not told what the other prophecies were that those prophets gave. The only prophecy that is listed for us and the name of a prophet given is one that produced an immediate response and an outpouring of Christian love. There's some other important things to notice here too. The prophet Agabus, it states that he came from Jerusalem. That was a city with the greatest need. But his message was not to Jerusalem. His message was to Antioch, the church with the resources. Notice something else. The giving was proportional. We mentioned that in passing a moment ago. God does not expect you to give what you do not have. That, by the way, is one of the problems with so-called faith promise giving. But God does expect you to give sacrificially. Verse, chapter 11, verse 29, Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea. Some had more, they gave more. Some had less, they gave less, according to his ability. The issue is not how much you give, but how much you retain for yourself. Remember what Jesus said about the woman who gave two mites, and notice the proportion that she kept. The proportion that she kept. Mark chapter 12, verse 41. Jesus sat over against the treasury and beheld how the people cast money into the treasury. And many that were rich cast in much. And there came a certain poor widow, and she threw in two mites, which make a farthing. And he called unto him his disciples, and saith unto them, Verily I say unto you, that this poor widow hath cast in more than all they which have cast into the treasury. For all they did cast in of their abundance. No sacrificial giving there. It was their surplus. Or as we might have in our society, what's the best tax balance that I can give in my giving? Because I'm in a tax bracket that's, you know, right above the line. So if I give a certain amount, I get below that tax bracket, I have less taken out of my taxes, and that means that I get to keep more. So I get a tax deductible receipt, and I also get to keep more that I didn't give, and so I'm the winner in the end, and the IRS loses. Dear people, if that's the way you figure you're giving, you're in serious trouble. They all did cast in of their abundance, but she of her want did cast in 90% of what she had and kept 10%. She of her want. In her deep poverty, like the churches of Macedonia, cast in all that she had. It clarifies it. Even all her living. That was her living expenses. Jesus knows, sir. You think that he, being God, and noticing her sacrificial giving, at that point abandoned her? After all, he'd never made her rich. So, why should he help her now? Did he abandon her, or do you suspect, and we're reading into the text at this point, but do you suspect that he, being God, who loved us enough to give himself for us, provided her next meal? I think he did. The one who loves much gives much. Remember 
when Jesus went to the home of a rich Pharisee. One of the Pharisees desired him, desired him this is Luke chapter 7, that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment, and stood at his feet behind him weeping, and began to wash his feet with tears, and did wipe them with the hairs of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman <laughs> this is that touches him. For she is a sinner. Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he saith, Master, say on. He's just criticizing him in his heart, but hypocritically he calls him Master. There was a certain creditor, Jesus speaking here now, which had two debtors, the one owed 500 pence and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said, Well, that's an easy question. I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house, thou gavest me no water for my feet. But she hath washed my feet with tears, and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss. But this woman, since the time I came in, hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint. But this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. And we read in other texts the value of that ointment up to a year's wage. Verse 47. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins which are many are forgiven. For she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. The woman showed the kind of love that we're exhorted in Scripture to show and by which we should be known. Listen to what Jesus said in John 13. This is in the upper room just before his crucifixion. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another. I have loved you. Remember the riches of glory that he left and became poor so that we might be rich? As I love you, that ye also love one another. Now here is the kicker. You see, people are watching you. By this, that is, the love that we have for one another, which is a practical love, a giving love. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. John 13, 34 and 35. This is our testimony to the watching world. This is the proof that we have believed sound doctrine. Gracious Heavenly Father, again we thank you for your word and for its power. Famine and fellowship. You produce the famines so that we might prove our love one to another. The times of need and distress, sometimes we're on the inhaling end, sometimes we're on the exhaling end. Sometimes we are the ones who receive. Sometimes we are called on to be the ones who give. We're not owners, we're stewards. You are the owner. The steward is responsible for distributing the resources of the master in the way in which the master commands them to be distributed. We pray, Father, that you will help us not to gain the spirit of covetousness, which is idolatry, Help us, Father, to remember our stewardship, for which we will give account. We pray these things in Jesus' name.
closing hymn for tonight is hymn number 225, Come Christians 